I have to move my work around. It's like I'm rubbing. Can you hear? Oh. Uh, do that. All right. Anyway, when you get a chance to get a three-day weekend, you look forward to it. Now, uh, Brother Greg, he's at church camp with the youth and Adam this weekend, so uh, he asked me to step in. Now, it's, it's kind of a joke that we have on, on the ministry staff. We like to tease Adam a lot, and we call him Old Six String because there's six of us pastors on staff. The problem is, though, we've never established who is two through five, so... Uh, they may just be, it may be a joke on me. I may be below six and just don't know it. But anyway, I'm glad I get to share with you today. Uh, for those who may be here and don't know me, uh, I'm Pastor Tim, or Mr. Tim as the kids like to call me, and I'm the children's pastor here at Living Faith. Uh, the ones that know me, I'm sorry, I'm going to just give you a little history, but uh, just a little bit about me. I've been married for 25 years now to my wife, Erica. I did find someone that could put up with me for 25 years. Praise God for that. And we have two grown daughters, uh, Gina and Tori. And I have worked as a machinist for the past 24 years. Now, if I had one word that I would use to describe me, it would be basic. Okay, I'm just a pretty basic guy. I'm not a lot about all the frills and add-ons. You can ask my wife, she would tell you, I'm not detail-oriented in any way. She actually tells me I'm oblivious most of the time. I just don't catch things. Uh, it, to me, it's just I'm more of a big-picture guy. Uh, generally, I just want what I need to get the job done, and I don't need a bunch of bells and whistles to complicate things for me. Now, I don't mean to put anyone down who likes those bells and whist whistles. You know, God bless you that you're able to use those things and get a little ease in life through them. To me, they just make it harder for me to understand. Uh, so I just prefer to keep it simple, and that's kind of my comfort zone. Now, I've also I've been attending uh, seminary extension classes for the past few years uh, in order to learn and to grow as a pastor. And I have gained quite a, a list of valuable knowledge to help me in my ministry. And I've taken some very challenging courses during that time as well. Now, usually... The courses that I find to be the most challenging, of course, are the theology courses. Because when you study theology, and it's good to do, it helps you to understand what you believe and why you believe it, but it can also get very deep, get very deep into the Scripture, very deep into the Gospel. Uh, and when you're discussing theology in a group of pastors, let me fill you in on a secret. We may smile and everything on Sunday morning. You might think that we're all happy all the time. But when we're in a group and we start discussing the Word of God together, it can get pretty heated sometimes. And it's not very Christian-like at times, too. I'm <laughs> just sorry about that, but that's just the facts. Uh, but I think it's because it's the way that, you know, we, we read the Scriptures and, and we interpret it. But it is good to study God's Word and to find meaning uh, for our lives and the direction that we need. But I also find, though, that when we take our, our eyes off of the main thing, it's easy, very easy, to get bogged down in all the doctrinal differences and all the ideals that can hinder the purpose of the message that Jesus has entrusted us with. Now, the Apostle Paul, he taught us that God is not a God of confusion. He is God of peace. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, Verse 14 and 15, Paul gave a young pastor some wise words of direction that are still relevant for every Christian today. It says, keep reminding them of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value. 
and it only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly handles the word of truth. You know, as someone who appreciates the basic, this passage is always... Uh, spoken to me, and it helps me focus when I'm teaching. So this morning, I thought I would share with you the simplicity of the gospel. And honestly, when you break it down, break down the message that Christ was trying to tell us, he really only told us two things that we need to know, to come and to go. Pray with me. Father God, we're just so thankful that you brought us this morning to hear your word. We're thankful that you woke us up again this morning and give us another day. Lord, we just pray as uh, we hear your words today that you'll just speak to every heart. Lord, open up our minds and our ears to hear your word. Open up our hearts to hold it. And Lord, I just pray that you move me out of the way and let my words be yours. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so as... As I've been studying through the Gospels and looked at the ministry and mission of Jesus, it's occurred to me that he didn't want us to miss what he's doing. As he taught, he spoke in parables, so that way it would be easy to understand. The people that he was talking to, he would, they would be able to get what he was trying to tell them. And they could relate to his examples and stories because they were things that they would be familiar with, such as farming or raising families or running businesses. But in these stories, he clearly defined what God, the message that God had for us, what God was trying to tell us, and that was that no one was living up to God's standards. Sin had corrupted us all, and we need forgiveness. Pretty simple message. Funny thing is, the ones that seemed to be the ones that didn't get the message were the ones that were actually teaching the law. That was the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. And the reason, because they had spent so much time studying and and getting deep into it and taking their eyes off of it, then they started getting off track, and then they started complicating the Word of God. And they'd been doing it for years. You know, all the the people in the Bible that uh, that is recorded that Jesus came in contact with You know, he was harder on the religious leaders than he was anybody else. And it was because that they had distorted the law of God that he had gave to the nation of Israel. And even worse than that, they began to require people to follow the law their way, to follow their standards, following their interpretations. Now, many times in the gospel, Jesus had conversations with these same teachers. And they were looking to catch him in a trap. You know, they wanted to trap him in his words. And they did this because they did not agree with what he was trying to tell the folks that were around listening. You know, in the books of the law in in the Bible, there are 613 laws that are mentioned. But the Pharisees, they also wanted to require everyone to follow all the oral traditions as well. Uh, they wanted to take their interpretation that had been handed down on how to keep the law, what you were supposed to do, how you were supposed to do this. Uh, they wanted to extend upon the laws. You can, uh, I, I looked something up this week just to kind of see something about that, and, and one of the first ones I, I came across through a, a Jewish website was they were talking about the Sabbath, keeping the Sabbath. Well, in the scripture, there was only like three things that it said you wasn't supposed to do on the Sabbath. But then they's like, but you have to extend it out because if you're going to include this, you must include this. And then you need to watch out for this too. And hey, let's not forget this. So the next thing you know, they couldn't do anything. They could barely feed themselves on the Sabbath because they had taken these oral traditions and stretched them out to a point that was far beyond what God was teaching. They got so wrapped up in the details of the law and how to keep the law, they were missing the heart of the law. Jesus often called them out for this hypocrisy. I'm going to share several scriptures with you today. Most of them you're going to be very familiar with. But I want want you to see how Jesus dealt with people, not only just the common people, 
but also how he dealt with the leaders and how he tried to bring them back to a point of understanding the, what God was actually trying to say and how simple the message really was. Let's look at Mark chapter 7, verses 5 through 13. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the, to the traditions of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it's written, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. You have to let go of the command or you have you have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of man. And he said to them, You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses his father and mother must be put to death. But you say, What if a man says to his father and mother, Whatever you might have otherwise received from me is Corban? That is a gift devoted to God. Then you no, you are no longer let, you no longer let them do anything for his father and mother. Thus, you nullify the word of God by your traditions that you have handed down, and you do many things like that. And when asked after this, because they again, like I said, were trying to catch him in his word, so they asked him what the greatest commandment was, and we can find that in Matthew twenty-two. Verse 37 through 40. And it says, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. So Jesus was making it simple. He was making it simple for all folks to see what God required of us. And in turn, he made it easy for them to see that they had not lived up to these requirements. You know, looking at the church today, and, and as I say this, I'm speaking of Christianity as a whole. I can't help but wonder, who do we look more like? Do we look more like the church that Jesus has established? Or we do look more like a church built on traditions and rules? You know, if we're not a church of mercy and grace, then we're getting it wrong. You know, thank God for sending his son to clear things up for us. And he has brought us the message of the gospel. And Jesus simplified everything so we could understand it. And this was the message. This is the gospel, simply put. To come and to go. Come and go. That's it. So let's spend a few minutes just looking at these words and just find how simple it is to find grace in Jesus. So step one, come to Christ. This is where we find salvation. We find forgiveness. When God gave the law to Moses and the whole Israelite nation, he didn't do it so he'd be cruel to them. He wasn't trying to take away their fun. He wasn't trying to make them, you know, afraid to move. Instead, the law was given for a completely different reason. It was given to them to help them become aware of sin. In the book of Romans, Paul tells us that the law is good. And he said this because it brings us to the knowledge of our inadequacies. You know, he even said, and he used the, some of the Ten Commandments as an example, he said, had the law not told him not to covet, then he wouldn't have known that coveting was wrong. And because of that, the law accomplished the purpose in his life that it was meant to do. It showed him that he had failed to live up to God's standards. But just like we humans do, we like to take simple things and we like to make them hard. And that's what the nation of Israel do, did. They took the law and then they built a religion around it and they made it complicated. And the more they studied the law, the further away from the, they got from the truth. And they just got deeper and deeper into this rigidness, this rule-following that has nothing to do with grace. They made it more complicated to the point that by the time Jesus came, most common 
folks in Israel, they were hopeless. They felt like they had no shot at ever making God happy. Some of them even quit trying. It's like, why bother? I can't keep all those rules. So they, they didn't even bother. So when Jesus came, common people were drawn to him because he had a message that they had never heard before. Jesus said, come. In Matthew eleven, twenty-eight 28 through 30, he says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Wow. That definitely simplified things, didn't it? All your problems in life, all the things you've struggled with, all your guilt, all the sin that's trapped you, all the drama that you have going on around you, all the things that steal your joy, Jesus gives us rest from these things when we come to him in faith. You know, back when I was young, I went to, when I got out of high school, I went to tech school up in Louisville. And I was living away from home for the first time, and I had got myself this car. Now, it wasn't anything particularly special, but it was good, reliable transportation. I was glad to have it. Well, I took out a loan at the bank to buy that car, and at the time, I was got a job up in Louisville, and I was working. I got a job at Rally's Hamburgers. You guys like Rally's Hamburgers? Yeah. They taste good. I hate cooking them. I absolutely hated it. Couldn't stand the job. And it always, they wanted me to come in when I wanted to do other things. And that just didn't jive with my life. I didn't like that. So one day I just decided, you know what, I don't like this. And I quit. Problem was I didn't bother to find another job first. 19-year-olds don't think the way they should sometimes, do they? So you can imagine when the due date came for that payment for my car, the bank was not impressed when I told them I didn't like flipping burgers. They didn't care. They didn't care if I didn't have any money in my bank account. They just wanted their payment. So after a couple of missed payments, the bank started getting real serious with me. And they were threatening to take my ride. I didn't want to lose my car. I loved that car. So as hard as it was for me to admit I had to call my dad and tell him that I quit my job, been kind of hanging out, living on the money you sent me, not really doing anything, and now they want to take my car and I need a loan again. Well, you can imagine my dad was not impressed with me either. But he did agree to spot me some money, try to help me get out of this position that I put myself in. And I did promise I was going to pay him back and I was dead serious about it. I even went out that week and beat the bushes, and I found another job to, you know, so I could make sure to pay Dad back. Uh, now, that was back years ago. It was a different time. Like now, you just get on an app on your phone, and you just type it in, and you know, send somebody money, and that's it. I had to wait for the mail. And to get from Ohio County to Louisville, it took two to three days. So I had to wait two or three days to get a check and tell the bank, hey, I'm going to pay you this week. Just wait. You know, it's coming. And I get the mail, open it up, and it's, to my surprise, in the envelope was not a check from my dad. It was the loan papers with a stamp on it that said paid in full. And dad also put a note in there, and he said, I just wanted to take some of the burden off of you. There's no need to pay me back. Let me tell you guys, that made me feel so free. But I learned a lesson from it. I didn't just say, good, I'm good to go and, and went on, you know. I, I did learn a lesson from that. But the pressure was off. My debt had been paid. That's exactly what Jesus has offered to us all as well. Rest from the burden of sin. The release from the punishment that we deserve. All we have to do is simply come to Christ. But what next? What do we do after we've come to that relationship with Christ? Well, Jesus made that simple as well. He said, go. 
That's easy. Come to him and then go and tell others. We like to call that evangelizing or going to the lost, sharing the good news, or the Great Commission. You probably hear that quite often. You know, before Jesus ascended into heaven, he left the followers with one final command. We find that in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And I really love this verse. It says so much. It says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You know, I love that verse because he laid out everything we needed to know right there. He told us when to go, how we were to go, and where we were to go. And the believers, when they received the Spirit, they boldly went. And they passed that message on to the next generation of believers who shared with the next generation. And here we are today, some 2,000 years later, and we're still sharing that message. Now, another interesting piece of that verse that I find is what it doesn't say. It doesn't say, go if you feel like it, or if you think it might be fun, or if you think you can share this without stepping on somebody else's toes or, or you know, making them feel uncomfortable or whatever, then go. It doesn't say any of that. It says, you will be my witnesses. It was a command for all who believe and all who will believe. So, again, Jesus made this simple. We're to go. But if there's so many lost in the world that need to be reached, why is it that there's so many Christians that don't want to go? Well, I think it's because we allow our humanness to get in the way. We can always think of reasons why we sh shouldn't do certain things. I can, I'm, I'm an excuse guy. I can find something to get out of anything if I really want. And, you know, we, we do that as Christians. We find excuses why this should be somebody else's job. Why it should be the missionary's job. Why it should be the pastor's job. Why it should be, you know, the youth director's job. Whatever. Now, one of the most common excuses I, I hear when, when you get to talking about, to people about going is, well, I don't know what to say. Well, like I said, Jesus made that simple for us. Have you received Christ as your Savior? That you've got something to say. That's enough. If you don't believe me, just look at his disciples for a minute. Okay, there was, let's look at Andrew. All right, and Andrew was actually a follower of John the Baptist. And then when John told everybody that Jesus was the Lamb of God, he quit following John, and he immediately started following Jesus. And the first thing that Andrew did was he went to his brother, Andrew, uh, brother Simon. We know him as Peter. And he said, we found the Christ. That was all he said, because that was all he knew. And then we can look at Philip. And Jesus called Philip to follow him, and Philip followed. And the first thing the Bible records that Philip did was go to his friend Nathaniel and say, Hey, we found the one that, the Mo that Moses and the prophets talked about. It's Jesus of Nazareth. Now, Nathaniel wasn't as easy to convince as, as Simon was. I mean, he, he questioned Philip, and he said, what good could come out of Nazareth? Now, I don't really know why he did this. I mean, maybe Judea High had a rivalry with Nazareth High in basketball or something. I have no clue. But for some reason, he had something against Nazareth. Philip didn't have a good answer for him. So he said the only thing that he knew. He said, come and see for yourself. You know, we don't have to have all the answers. In fact... I'm sure we've all got questions as well. So just be obedient and go. Let the Spirit do its work. You don't have to have a degree in Bible study to be able to share the good news of Christ with others. You don't have to have a degree to invite someone to come and see for themselves. Now sometimes we allow fear to, to creep in and that stops us from going in Jesus' name. Now, during Jesus' ministry, there were times that he sent his followers out without him to go and prepare things for him. Uh, he sent his followers out in the world to share about God's love and mercy. One time, the Bible tells us that he sent his 12 out. 
And he told them with specific instructions how they were to go and where they were to go. There was another time where he sent out a larger group, like we read about in Luke chapter 10, when he sent out 72. It tells us, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. And he told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into your harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. Does that sound fun? I don't think it sounded very fun myself. In fact, that sounded pretty terrifying. Lambs among wolves? And that's what he wants us to do? Well, let's look at what it says later on in verse 17 when the 72 came back. It said, The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. You know, in, in Luke chapter 22, Jesus also asked the 12 disciples after they had been on their trip. He, he asked them at the Last Supper about their journey. And he said, when I sent you out without purse or bag or sandals, did you lack anything? You know what their answer was? We lacked nothing. He took care of everything. He even made it simple for us to go. He was going to go with us. Through his power in his Holy Spirit, he was going to send us with everything that we needed. You know, being afraid to tell others about Jesus should never, ever hinder us in our command to go. In Shine this past month, our memory verse has been Psalms 56. See if I can get this right. It said, I will trust in God. I will not be afraid. What can the people do to me? I get two prizes for that. I did the motions. All right. All right. But that verse tells us a lot right there, doesn't it? What can people do to us? Why should we be afraid? We can trust in God. So don't let fear make you forget that you have the power of the Holy Spirit in you, okay? Don't let fear make you forget that you have the power of the Holy Spirit in you. This is the same Holy Spirit, guys, that empowered those first believers to come out of hiding and boldly go into a world to share the good news a world that was hostile to them so that we could get a chance to know the God of all creation and have a relationship with him today. Now, another excuse we like to sometimes use is, well, nobody wants to hear my story. I don't really have a story. You know, and, and I, I hear that occasionally, especially from people that have been in church all their life. They, they got saved when they was little, and they've been going to church ever since, and that's it, they think. They're like, I don't really have a story. I don't have a good testimony. Folks, if you're alive, you have Christ in your life, you have a testimony. Let me tell you a story about my daughter, Gina. I'm going to throw her under the bus this morning a little bit. But Gina got saved at home one night when I think she was in about fourth or fifth grade. We had been to see the power team down at the community center, and they were doing their... Uh, crusade. If you remember the power team, those were the guys, big strong guys that bent bars of metal and told us about Jesus loving you. And she went and she got the message, but she was too scared to go to the stage when they asked her to come up. So she come home that night and she ended up, her and Erica had a conversation and she got saved there at home. But as she got older and then she started hearing other people give their testimonies and tell their stories, it started bothering her. She's like, well, I don't really have a story. I was at home. And it bothered her. Now, you know, I understand where she's coming from a little bit because, you know, she was just a kid when she got saved. I mean, as far as I know, and if she'd done something else, she's never let me know about it. But as far as I know, the worst thing she had done at that point was steal cookies and hide them under her bed and then lie when she got caught. You know, uh, so she would pray and ask God to give her a story to tell. Well, midway through her freshman year of high school, they found a tumor in her leg. She was having some pain in her leg, and they found a tumor. 
So we had to go have tests done, and we had a PET scan run, and the initial test come back that it was cancerous. Well, you know, through the faith of that little girl and healing from God, and I'm going to give God all the glory there because I know he's the one that healed her. Once we did get through a couple of months and they had surgery and they took that tumor out and they tested it, it came back benign. So there was no problems. But Erica and me being the parents that we are, we looked at her and we're like, well, now you got your story, Gina. Go share it. So, you know, a few years later, we were having a youth day at church and uh, she agreed that she would give her testimony. Now, that same weekend... Oddly enough, she started having problems walking. And when she gave her testimony, they had to bring a stool out for her to sit in the stool while she gave her testimony because she couldn't hardly stand up and hold herself up. Actually, that evening, we ended up taking her to the hospital, and they admitted her because they couldn't figure out why she had lost the ability to walk. And there was two or three months there where she couldn't walk at all, and neurologists were doing test after test and couldn't find anything or figure anything out. Uh... So that was a really hard thing. But eventually they were able to come up with something, a diagnosis that was able to help her some. It's still something that she's going to have to deal with the rest of her life. So there may be times that you see her and everything's fine. Next time you see her, she might be rolling around in her chair. But you know what she'll tell you now? She said, well, that's just part of my story. You know, from a dad's perspective, though, I'll just tell you all, thank God if you don't have a vivid tale of suffering or a, a tale of how deep you were dragged down by sin from earthly standards. But I also want to tell you, don't shortchange God. Jesus died to save us all from death because we have all sinned. And that in itself is all the testimony that you need to go. So however God has made his presence known in your life, that's your story. Use it. Go share it. You know, the message of Christ, it's not complicated. He chose ordinary, largely uneducated men to go and start his church. And the message of Christ is still going strong today. And people are still going out into those places and telling people about Jesus' love and his forgiveness and his mercy. They're going obediently in his name to their Jerusalems and their Judeas and Samarias and the ends of the earth. And folks, the fields are right, right here in our Jerusalem, our community. And I would like to invite you to go and share the good news right here where you're at, in your own backyard. You know, next week our, is our VBS here at Living Faith. And I'd love to challenge everyone to please help us reach our community tell them about Jesus. Now, I don't want to say that this is the biggest outreach we have in this church uh, each year, but I do want to say it does take a lot of people to be able to work together to be able to share this message of Christ with our community. You know, VBS isn't just an event that we do either. You know, I know it always looks fun and there's always colorful, colorful characters but that's more for the kids. The message is still the same. And it's intentional. It's intentional to tell the kids and family that God loves them, whoever they are, whatever they've done, whatever their background, and he wants them to come and know him and have a relationship and, and get forgiveness. So I want to ask, will you help us to go? We still have several areas uh, on our volunteer list that we need. Uh, we need people to help in games. We need people to help in nursery still. We need people, if you can't be here that week, that's fine. We need people to help us tear down and put the church back together because it's, it's a big thing that we do all the way through the church. It takes several hours, and we could use the help just uh, tearing it down and getting everything set back up for Sunday morning. I would love it if people would just simply say, I will volunteer to come up here and go into a room and just pray for the kids during VBS. I will pray for the workers in VBS. Just come every night. We'll find a place for you to go, and you can just pray during that time. I would love to have that. Uh, those are just a few of the ways that we can go in Christ. Now, I promise you, there's a spot 
for everybody to help if they're willing. Also, if you have kids or grandkids or you have neighbor kids, be a Philip to them. Invite them to come and see for themselves. Uh, Whatever you do, don't let this opportunity pass you by and miss out on the blessing of serving your community in the name of Jesus. And I understand work schedules too. If there's no way that you can come and, and you kind of feel like, well, I know I need to help. We have some flyers laying out here on the, on the desk. If you could just take some flyers and take them around into town and, and have them put up in gas stations or at your workplace or whatever to invite people. Hey, that's you reaching out and going in Christ. So as I leave you today, I just want to ask, how are you going? Not how are you doing, but how are you going? Are you living your life surrendered to God? and sharing the good news of forgiveness with others? Are you making the most of every opportunity? Or do you find yourself hiding behind excuses that the enemy's been using to deceive you? You know, guys, God is able to do far beyond all that we can ask or imagine by the power of his work within us. So let today be the day that you say yes to going. Or maybe you're here today and you've never said yes to Christ's invitation to come. To come and find rest for your soul. Well, I'm here to tell you today that that is a very easy thing to do as well. Just believe that Christ came to earth to die for your sin. And he was raised from death to be your savior. And now he has the power to forgive that sin. Next, realize that you have that sin in your life and you need that forgiveness. And then ask Jesus to forgive that sin and change your heart. And then tell others. Go and tell others what God has done for you and what He can do for them. It's just that easy. Message of the gospel is simple. Come and go. Christ did all the hard work for us. So will you come and go in his name? Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you so much for the mercy that you give us. And we thank you so much that you were willing to come to earth to die for our sins and also let us to know that all we have to do is simply come to you to receive that forgiveness. Lord, we know Your word tells us that you understand that we're just flesh and we don't always get things right. Thank you for your mercy and your grace that you show us. Today, Lord, I just pray that if there be anybody here that doesn't know you, that today will be the day they decide to come and make that choice to follow you and receive that mercy and forgiveness. Lord, I pray also that those who have come that you will now boldly strengthen them so that they will be willing to go, whether it be in our community or be halfway across the world, just to share your good news of forgiveness and love. Lord, I just pray that you will let them understand the power of the Holy Spirit working within them and that we do not have to be afraid because you are bigger than anything that we can be afraid of. Father, I pray that you just continue to work on our hearts and show us your ways. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.